my name is Bobby Rosenblum. I'm a uh, shareholder in the law firm Greenberg Traurig in the Atlanta office, and um, I, I primarily work in the digital music and entertainment space. And I, I'm really just delighted to present what I think is going to be a terrific panel, a group of panelists in particular. Um, and some of you may know uh, some of these folks or all of them, but they are really a great group, and we hope to create and maybe spark a little bit of controversy here. Um, first, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, to my immediate right is, is a good friend of mine and also one of the top, uh, from my perspective, digital uh, law music lawyers in, in the country. Um, we, we work with him pretty regularly. and he, He's at the Warner Music Group. He's senior vice president and head of digital legal affairs, Elliot Peters. Um, Elliot works with Warner's worldwide business development team. Uh, he leads the Digital Legal Affairs Department in the negotiation and execution of new tech deals. He oversees legal issues related to digital rights clearances and policies and strategies as well. Uh, before joining Warner Music Group, Elliot was with the firm Sherman & Sterling, where he practiced in general corporate law in the M&A and corporate finance departments in New York, uh, as well as London and Hong Kong from 95 to 2000. Uh, Elliot went to uh, receive a BS degree from Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania and his JD from Columbia Law School. I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> uh, next to Elliot's right is Debbie Spander, from, who is Vice President of Business and Legal Affairs at MTV Entertainment, uh, a division, of course, of Viacom. Um, Debbie focuses on comedy, sports, and digital media. Uh, she's responsible for structuring, negotiating, and managing development and original programming deals overseeing business and legal aspects of LA-based productions, including multimedia rights acquisitions. Um, she, for example, assists Spike TV in acquisition of sports programming and works with Adam Entertainment's LA development team. Uh, before, and I think this is important because Debbie's gonna talk a little bit about sports issues in the, the user-generated content space. She was vice president of business and legal affairs for Fox Cable Networks, uh, and handled work for uh, Fox Sportsnet, Fox Sports, FX, including NASCAR, the PGA Tour, and Major League Baseball. Uh, Debbie uh, is a graduate of Stanford University and uh, also UCLA School of Law. Um, to Debbie's right is uh, Zahava Levine, and Zahava is a, uh, is a fixture in the digital music world, has worked with many of the leading companies I in the space. <laughs> Uh, uh, Zahava is currently chief counsel for YouTube. Um, she oversees partnership agreements with record companies, music publishers, uh, networks, movie motion picture studios, and uh, other organizations in the content space. Uh, she previously was associate general counsel and director of music licensing for Real Networks and was responsible for music licensing for uh, Real Networks products and services such as Rhapsody, Radio Pass, and Super Pass. Uh, she was before that uh, an attorney at the firm of Bingham McCutcheon and uh, graduate of uh, Bolt Hall Law School of Law at UC Berkeley and Brown University. And to Zahava's right, finally, but uh, not least, is uh, Armando Lawrence, who's a private practitioner who practices both in New York and Puerto Rico. Um, specializing in intellectual property and internet matters, representing a number of online publishers uh, to bring that perspective to the panel. Um, you know, to start out, what I would, I, I'd kind of like to set up what I think is, is really the, the critical and most interesting part of the world of, of user-generated content and internet 2.0, as you hear the, uh, the term thrown around. You know, perhaps never in the history of the, of the media industries has the advent of a new technology or medium presented such profound challenges? And you can point to things like Napster and peer-to-peer, -peer, but to, to an extent, those technologies were really more just about a new means of distribution that was challenging because of piracy aspects to those, to those technologies. But user-generated content is very different because what it effectively has done is it's turned the entire media world on its head. Rather than media industries basically controlling the flow of content, creating content and controlling the experience that the user uh, receives, now you have situations where people are able to take other media content and incorporate that potentially into their own uh, videos, their own uh, you know, home movies, their own uh, you know, 
political diatribes, whatever the, they may be, and creating their own form of entertainment or infotainment or uh, otherwise. And the question is, what do we do about that? And there are two aspects of this that, that on this panel we're going to explore that I think are most interesting. Number one is the, the legal challenges and the legal uh, issues related to copyright, related to trademark and you know, other intellectual property infringement, and what is infringement, how do we go after it, how does Section 512 of the DMCA come into play, uh, Section 230 of the uh, Online Communication Decency Act, other sorts of is legal issues like that. So that, that's one set of problems that, that I, I think we want to explore. The second issue, though, to me is really the more intriguing one, and that is let's say that you have companies that want to do the right thing and want to acquire licenses. How do we do it? Is there a way to license user-generated content offerings in a way that will allow this technology to thrive? Or it, are we not going to figure out a way to license this, this form of content? And are we going to create a whole new array of cat and mouse type games where you know, we kill Napster and people go to Grokster, you kill Grokster and people go to LimeWire, and, all, and, and so on and so forth. Because if one believes that there's really no way to stop those who are going to do the wrong thing on the internet, then maybe the answer is how do we encourage as many people as possible to do the right thing and figure out a way to license. You know, a, a friend of mine, um, I'll give him credit, a, a lawyer in town, Bill Hart, uh, at Proskauer Rose, who's representing uh, a number of content owners in some of the uh, current litigation against file share, against some of the user-generated content sites, said uh, on a panel a few uh, weeks ago um, something that I thought was apropos here. He said, you know, there really is no such thing as user-generated content. It's actually other people's content. And, uh, you know, from the content owner's perspective, you know, one question is when you look at a lot of the sites that are operating today, is the compelling content really the true user-generated content where there's uh, absolutely no third-party material, music, film clips, you know, other properties at all otherwise? Or is most of it really uh, incorporating other intellectual property? I mean, sure, there are the, you know, the, uh, the off-the-beaten-path examples we can think of that, that virally spread around the net. But, you know, is it really infringement of intellectual property? Something to, for the panelists that, that we're going to get into. Um, but, you know, the questions like where does fair use come into play? These are the types of things that, that we want to talk about. What about the international dimension? You think about these issues in the United States. Where does it go? Uh, what happens when we start thinking about all of these issues outside of the U.S.? And it really is one of the themes that I want to come back to uh, again and again throughout the discussion is, is there a balance? Has, you know, with Section 512 and the protection, of the, which we're going to get into a little bit if you're not as familiar with it, but is there a balance between protecting the rights of service providers and fostering new services, but also protecting the rights of content owners? Has the pendulum swung too far because of the, 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 the way that Section 512 works? And, or has it not? Or is it working the way that it ought to be? And that's something that uh, I think we really ought to think about during the course of this panel. So with that, let's turn to our panelists. And we're going to start with uh, Armando. Um, you know, and, I'm, and Armando is going to provide, I think, a bit of a background of some of the legal principles, a little bit about some of the cases that are pending right now, and uh, kind of setting the framework for the discussion that will follow. Yeah, thank you, Bobby. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, before I go in talking about the law, I actually want to just follow up on what Bobby is talking about because I think one of the reasons I, I was asked to be on this panel was to provide a perspective that isn't just uh, what the different businesses or the business interests are, what is the music publishing business interest is in this, what is the, uh, the interest of other uh, uh, large uh, business organizations that are involved in different legal disputes. One of the things that I think is, has mi been missing a lot from the discussion is the balanced policy issue, but also in terms of what citizens and online publishers who are not in making millions of dollars, they're making a living, some of them, some of them making a little better than others, but uh, what they're, a lot of them are providing is, is a, an outlet for free expression on any number of topics, uh, politics, uh, media, criticism, and what have you. And what uh, is going to be the next step? Well, we're all lawyers, so 
we look at, tend to look a lot about what's going to happen in the courts, but uh, one of the things that I think we probably need to look at is what might be happening in the Congress on issues like this, on issues like net neutrality and whatnot. That said, I'll, I'll uh, now go through a little bit of the background of, this, of the issues of Section 512 and Section, two th Section 512 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and then also Section 230 of the Online Decency Act. Um, the Online Copyright Infringement Liability Act, which is what Section 512 is, is uh, in essence uh, what's being argued a bit about what exactly it is, but in its most essence it seems to be a safe harbor for uh, publishing online uh, user-generated content. That is, the, by definition, if you're an online publisher, the classic uh, idea of it would be an AOL or someone like that, and someone publishes something on, uh, online in their service, they, uh, and it's an infringement, or someone claims it's an infringement of the copyright, uh, they can issue a notice pursuant to 512 to AOL, whoever believes their, their intellectual property has been infringed, and that would obligate AOL to investigate and decide whether they have to take it down or not. There is, there's other uh, provisions that, uh, that talk about counter notices if, you, if the uh, original user does not believe he, he uh, initiated a copyright infringement, he can notice as well. There's a series of requirements in terms of registering. But uh, the more interesting policy issues, and I think the more interesting legal issues now are, how do you, how can you avail yourself of the safe harbor of Section 512? And there is litigation ongoing now about different definitions of that. But the basics seem to be this, that uh, an online service provider to, to obtain the safe harbor has to not have actual knowledge that the material is, uh, on the system is infringing. Um, not be aware of facts or circumstances from which the ac infringing activity is apparent Oh, and, or, and upon obtaining such knowledge or awareness must act ex expeditiously to remove or disable access to that material. And then this is one of the more interesting uh, sticking points that I think is going to be a big contention in, in pending litigation, not receive a financial benefit directly attributable to the infringing activity uh, in a case in which the service provider has the right and ability to control such activity. That, what does that mean? That's going to be decided in some of these cases, but as I understand it, 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 what it means is that you're not directly benefiting, making money from uh, the infringing activity itself. And directly will be a, a word that I'm sure might come up again in, this, in these discussions. What is the policy behind it? And I think that's really one of the, the more interesting parts of of the debate about 512. Uh, in uh, March of this year, Lawrence Lessig wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times discussing the, the, uh, this provision and what he thought the purpose was. And that's under debate now uh, in the courts and, and among uh, academics. But Lessig's argument was that this was indeed to provide a safe harbor, to allow an expansive use of the internet to, to spread information. To, to, uh, to avoid chilling the free flow of ideas. Um, was it the right balance in 1998? Is it the right balance now? Is that actually the legal balance that, that we are? That's, those are the things I think we will want to talk about at length. And I, and I think that uh, that is, to me, the most interesting discussion to, to, that we can have, even as lawyers now, is what is it that would be the strike the right balance in the policy on, on this uh, safe harbor? The, the other uh, provision that has given uh, a great deal of consternation and even and created a lot of uh, litigation is the Section 230 of the Online Decency Act, which provided a safe harbor to, as, as it's been interpreted, I think, pretty conclusively now by the courts uh, from Zoran on, the Zoran versus AOL case and all its progeny, have basically, I think, established that uh, uh, online service providers and, that, and it's a very broad definition. I think now it's not just AOL, it's anybody that has a blog and somebody posts a comment on the blog uh, type of thing. Um, it provides basically uh, immunity to the, to the, uh, public, the online publisher. Uh, now this is, in, in the opinion of many people, it, it goes too far. Perhaps it does, 
But I think that, uh, that the case law has been pretty conclusive. If you read Zaran and on down, and, in, and most recently, there's an unpublished opinion in the Third Circuit uh, called uh, DeMail versus Max, um, in which there was, uh, in essence, a, a, a number of allegedly defamatory comments about a party planner, I think he was. And he got very upset about it, and he sued uh, the online publisher um, in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. They went up to the Third Circuit. They reiterated the, their position uh, that they've held in, in uh, Sarandon, in essence, and extended it to say that basically, in essence, uh, everybody along the line, from AOL down to the lowliest blogger who has you know, uh, five readers, uh, is covered by Section 30 of the Online Decency Act. Now, what is the online decency, what does Section 230 say precisely? In essence, what it means is that all online service publishers uh, are not responsible for third-party content uh, except for, and this is, you have to see the interaction between For sections. defamation and libel. Well, it's further than, yes, it was specific for defamation and libel, but it goes further. There's been a, most, a recent case that said that it actually preempts all state law actions of any type. So uh, if there's anything that, uh, any state intellectual property laws, they also have been preempted by Section 230. The, the interplay between Section 512 and, uh, of the uh, DMCA and Section 230 is that, indeed, the copyright infringement op, uh, 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 notice and takedown provision provides uh, copyright uh, owners uh, an opportunity to defend their their rights and at the same time giving an, a, a, a potential safe harbor to publishers. But uh, Section 230 of Online Decency Act, I believe, and there may be some differences here on that, um, covers uh, all other causes of actions under uh, state law, and I believe under federal law, other than, of course, criminal prosecutions, uh, child ECPA actions, uh, child decency acts, uh, child online privacy information act, there, there are a number of other provisions, but the general, it's a general blanket immunity for, uh, for different types of tort actions, I think, both under federal and state law, other than what's provided for in, in the Copyright Act and the other provisions that I've discussed. Finally, there's a, this, the other thing I wanted to touch on uh, briefly here was uh, the user-generated content. Now, there's a case that's pending. I think it has to be discussed. I don't know how much we'll get to discuss it here, but it involves uh, two companies, uh, uh, one of them that's known for its music videos and one that's known for, for its ability to create, uh, allows users to create online videos. Uh, and they are, uh, I believe, the essence of the case is that they are debating um, exactly what is required to, to avail yourself of the safe harbor uh, of Section 512 of the DMCA. Um, if you look at the discussions of the Grokster case, which Bobby mentioned, and Napster, and how much interplay is there there that. Now, Le Lawrence Lessig, as I mentioned in his article before, had a discussion that I believe took an expansive view of, 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 uh, of what the immunity is, uh, and there has been some pushback on that. But um, the contours of what it will be, what it means, what the requirements will be for online publishers and others who uh, use unit uh, user-generated content to not only monitor but to take down to make sure that they are not creating uh, a situation where uh, they are facilitating uh, actively or deliberately again these are all going to be heavily litigated uh, issues but those are that's the cases where you're going to see what that means exactly um, until Congress uh, decides or does not decide to to clarify what they th what uh, what they meant, I think that the uh, the more interesting discussion again. I mean, as lawyers, we're going to be following what's going on in the courts, but I actually uh, more interested to see what the 
underlying policy uh, debate that that will uh, spring from the, these issues. I, I when we've spoken uh, as a group on uh, on the phone a few times, I've uh, always stressed that uh, for for a lot of the online publishers who are not making big dollars, this is not. It's not so much an issue of money for them. It's such an issue of respecting that they need to uh, have original creative content protected and uh, fuel a lot of their own creativity. At the same time, the, they fear the chilling effect of onerous requirements for them uh, in order to use existing uh, uh, intellectual property in a way that might that they feel might comply with fa fair use. It is a balance that I think that uh, people of good faith need to address and think about. And uh, my hope is that uh, that this panel starts that a little bit. Thanks, Armando. So Zahava, let's turn to you now. Maybe uh, I'm, why don't you provide a little insight on what your company is doing and what some of the issues are that you see uh, in this space? Okay. Um, I'm just going to pick up a little bit where you left off in terms of the balance that the DMCA um, sets up. And it's not, Larry Lessig may have cited this in an article, but it's not some wild, radical interpretation of the DMCA. It, there's no question, it's well documented in the legislative history that, um, the, that the DMCA set up a balance which balances the rights of the copyright holders um, while protecting online innovation and the growth of the internet. Um, the purpose of the DMCA was to facilitate the growth of the internet um, and services like YouTube. Congress explained in the legislative history, quote, oh, so the reason that, the, that services, online services need a safe harbor is because when you're hosting content or um, linking to content, right, hosting content requires that actually a copy is made onto the server or linking to content could be, you know, perceived to be some sort of con contribu con contributory uh, act to access the content or something like that. So what Congress explained in the Senate report is that in the ordinary course of their operations, service providers must, eng must engage in all kinds of acts that expose them to potential copyright infringement liability. By limiting the liability of service providers, the DMCA ensures the efficiency of the internet will continue to improve and that the variety and quality of services on the internet will continue to expand. It was a very forward-thinking law and it has worked. I think it's very important to understand